Hello, folks, and welcome back to World War II TV. And a little break from Arnhem Week. We are deeping, diving into the Luftwaffe in Poland. And uh, the reason this show was timed for this particular week is it was the official release of the book, the kind of publicity party for it yesterday. And um, that's why we timed it for this week. Um, so for those of you who saw Dr. Philip Blood's last appearance on World War II TV, where he talked about leadership in the SS, it was and remains one of my most popular shows so far this year despite the kind of grimness of the subject and the subject today will be fairly grim but one has to just hand it to the way dr blood just explains these things just outstanding so i've been looking forward to this presentation so um yeah without further ado i will introduce uh, dr philip blood so um how are you doing this evening phil great to see you woody um thank you very much for hosting this week of the release of the book um I really do appreciate what you're doing for me and what you're doing for the rest of the history community. So, well, that's very kind of you to say. And uh, and I have I'm I'm only about halfway through the book, um, <laughs> but it is it is I, I can't tell you how many books I have to read right now, and I kind of juggle them like spinning plates beside my bed. And I think I have a little go at that one tonight, and a little go at that one tonight, and you know, th th there's just not enough time hours of the day. But anyway. The, the 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 third or so I've read, I've 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 found really really amazing. I mean, it's it just you can absolutely get from the work that this has been a fifteen year pursuit of yours to get this out. And you know, there are people who do lots of books. There are people who do like one. Uh, and you know, I admire your your dedication to getting this subject out there, despite the fact it's kind of a fairly heavy subject, and you're kind of as we'll discover tonight, you know, that you're challenging various misconceptions and pre you know, people have this idea that the, the bad guys at the SS, the Wehrmacht, the Luftwaffe, the Luftwaffe particularly. We talked, of course, with Victoria Taylor recently about the, the, the chivalry that was appearing to be there in the Battle of Britain between the Messerschmitt pilots and Spitfire pilots. And we're not saying that didn't happen, but there's a there's a wider, deeper story, and that's what we're going to touch on tonight. So as usual, you've come prepared with your own PowerPoint presentation. So we are talking about Birds of Prey, the new book out this week um, by Dr. Philip Blood. And of course, folks, the links to purchase the book are in the description below. And I know some of you are watching have already read it or halfway through it um, and are finding it outstanding. So really over to you uh, and to, to kind of take us through this, this story and what we're talking about. Have we got the questions? I'll put them up now. There we go. What, there, they're coming in there now. Do you know, for a second, I couldn't actually remember them. <laughs> you you put them in a clever transition there. That's what happened there. You'd forgot. So, yeah. So so this, well, I'll, I'll read them out, then I'll let you respond, because I do feel I won't be saying very much during this show. So let me have my little bit of uh, attention at the beginning. So this is the start of, of, of the presentation. So what was Goring's political ambition for Luftwaffe? How did the Luftwaffe train men to kill? What role did the NCO play? And why was killing essential to forging the ideological warrior? Uh, so fa three fairly deep and heavy questions there. And and just, you know, they're the questions you've posed to us at the beginning of this presentation. Were they the questions that you started with when you began the research project? Or did the research start and your questions kind of formulate during the process? I have to be honest. The questions came as I get as I got closer to the end, um, because what I started with was nowhere near this. Uh, I was so far away from where we are now; uh, it's quite incredible the journey. And um, yeah, you, you, you very kindly mentioned it's been fifteen years of dedicated work. The problem was for nearly uh, six of those years. It was just literally stuck in the mud trying to work out what was what this subject was. I had a set of documents, and as I'll explain later, um, we had no way of connecting. Um, and to a certain extent, what this what this presentation is um, uh, I've, I've set is to show how these things connect and how it all comes together. And if you if you like, I I put these these three questions together because I wanted to give to give people a little mental map because I know many people go through the First World War, then the Second World War, or vice versa, and they have concepts about the German soldier. And what I'm doing there is saying in 1914, you have the Imperial soldier. In 1916, you have the Stormtrooper emerge. 1940, we see the Blitzkrieg soldier. 
but in 1943 we had the ideological soldier and that that's just giving a little map of the time scale um that i've actually had to go through to get where i am today yeah so if we go to to two and I, I can show the themes and the and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve um, from this talk. And really what I set myself to do was to walk in step with ordinary soldiers. Now, that <laughs> when you first think about that, walking in step with ordinary soldiers is pretty easy because the war diary says um, you you have fighting power you you might have some racial do racial ideology um military dogma luftwaffe culture non-primary groups or primary groups but you have these other things happening which is the operational training the the nature of our tribes tactic the style of mission command operations with ncos you have cohesion um i'm going to be talking about blooding and yudenyag which is you know hunting jews but joining them all together <laughs> it's near on impossible unless you go through a process and we went through that process uh, and i'm about to um, lead you into it so if we can if we go to the next one i'm just very briefly going to say that the that this first part is a background because i'm going to be engaging with nazi structures of racial violence and there's a stuff going on there which is a little bit complex and I know in the last 24 hours, people have sent me some interesting DMs suggesting that it's very difficult to understand some of the things I'm talking about. So I'm just doing this a little background, walk us through to where we're going to be, if you like. So mm. if we, and, and, and we appreciate that. And by the way, what, uh, although I'm not, I can't confess to read the whole book, I like the way you are expressing, you're explaining your methodology as well. You're explaining the process of how you do the research, not just the, the conclusions from the research. But, you know, you're kind of like a magician explaining how you do the trick as well as actually giving you the trick because, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the, the mapping technology you brought to this later on, of course. But to me, that was the thing that I, I felt, not only was I learning from a historian, that I was learning how you as a historian learned how to become a better historian by by doing the work of a historian, if that isn't a bit of a jumble of a, mouth, a sentence there. But I, I, I fully appreciate it more. I'm appreciating this, the journey your book takes us on. And I, and I guess we'll do the same tonight with the, with the presentation. To, there's, a, there's a mirror effect here. I am going to show that, um, but you're very kind. Yes, we, we tried to put in an aid memoir and expose 1942 and also micro histories as triangulation of activities as historian scholar researcher doing and you know putting all of that together because it, this is an exceedingly complex project um and as you see here one of the things that we hear all the time about Hermann Goering is that he's Hitler's paladin the problem with Hermann Goering unlike Himmler is Goering goes through a series of political identities throughout his life now, I, I could actually talk about the period up to 1933, but we just haven't got the time. So the political identity I'm going to point out here is the position of Reichsjägermeister. Now, this is the state uh, huntsman, if you like, the master of the, of the Nazi hunt. And you see, next to Hitler and Bambi, Goering is standing there in, the, in his leather smock. Um, you wouldn't believe that that Hitler was not only vegetarian, but anti-hunting. And yet there they are on this hunting estate. And what you glean from that is that Hitler allows Goering an enormous amount of leeway. Now on the other picture, you see Goering in his hunting regalia and he's behind him are two men um, on to my left, his right, uh, is Walter Freiber, and he will be one of the people that I will briefly discuss. I don't want to do too much detail about him, but he was Hitler's personal hunter. The one on the other side, um, you see more of the face, more of the complete picture, is Ulrich Scherping, and he was what's called the Reich's Oberst hunter, the, the colonel, if you like, of the hunt, which dated back to an imperial title, and his attitude was to bring an ideology of hunting to the German soldier. 
Yeah. So in a sense, you, we've got three guys who are ideologues of the hunt, and yet we still haven't at this stage talked about the Luftwaffe. Yeah. Mm. So Hitler, uh, Hitler's paladin. Now we talk about the Luftwaffe, and the Luftwaffe comes two years after Goering has been uh, in command of forestry and hunting, and the Luftwaffe steams in as this symbol of Nazi modernity. So we, we've gone from a chap who's wearing classical um, hunting gear from what looks like a, a, an older period, uh, actually dates only from the 1840s, uh, suddenly bringing in the flyer uh, and, and the middle class professional. And you can see a group of guys there who we can easily recognize. But right in the middle is, is a man called Heinz, uh, um, Hans Ulrich Rudel, who was the Stuka pilot. That's what the Stuka said. He was anti-hunt. So within the idea of building a, a, um, a hunting flyer, you have a clique within the Luftwaffe who are anti the hunt. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but it just shows that there wasn't, it wasn't just so easy for Goering within his own organizations to say, everybody's going to go through this. Everybody and just a quick question, because when you say the hunt, I immediately think of a British kind of version of the hunt. And I think of, you know, foxes and hounds. Is, that, is it still the same, or was it, I should say, a class, a class issue back then in the, in 1930s Germany? Was it, was it, I mean, obviously, peasant people have to hunt to live but we're talking about recreational um um social climbing hunting i'm assuming so similar to what was going on in britain yes but they hunt with rifles the fox and hounds has been banned going banned right. it immediately um the other the other thing here is in 1848 um hunting was liberalized to the point where middle class men could hunt freely on german lands so what Goering is expressing by developing the hunt is the middle class social order across all of his organizations. Yeah. Mm. So if we go to the next one, um, what I've done here is to compose what I call the blue and the green, which is the blue of the Luftwaffe, the green of the Reichsjägermeister and the foresters. And you get this marriage of culture, blue and the green warrior and hunter. Now, on the black and white picture, you can see Werner Mulders, who is the famous um, fighter pilot who set operational tactical policy uh, on, the, on the side there. He's standing with Goering and Goering's in his master hunting uniform. And you can see that they're standing around dead stags. Okay. Now, to the left, you see the book by uh, Walter Freyvert, who is Goering's master hunter, which um, introduced the idea of a hunting code, which all of the Luftwaffe chaps would embody and embrace. So, so you have literature being created about the modernity of the Luftwaffe, like the book on the to, to the left. At the same time, you have a chap who's creating a culture of hunting um, to fulfill what to fulfill Goering's ambition. And you actually see the marriage in this painting of Goering in 1937. Mm. And if, if you look at the top of the hat, you'll see that the Nazi, um, you know, the, the full Nazi eagle and badge. But down to the throat, you'll see the Pula Merit, which he won in the First World War as a fighter pilot. But the green cuffs and, and collars, that's the hunt and forestry. And so what you see here is the state, the hunt, and the, and the Air Force combined into one organization. Okay, so if we could just, that was too fast, that question. I'm sorry, I lost it's it. It's not a question, it's a comment. It just, it's just okay. about the Huntsman character featuring in, in, in Brothers Grimm and German folk stories. Yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a long traditional cultural identity of the Huntsman and the Woodsman, and, and, and that was what Gary was saying there. All of that's coming into this uh, process. And so if we go to the next uh, slide. Now, 
We're play, getting close now to the, the Polish forest where all the activity is going to take place. And the first top great black and white picture is Goering hunting in the forest, which took place in February 1937. And then below in November 1937, during a, a hunting conference, a, a massive exhibition that was to rival almost the Olympic Games of the previous year, he's standing before a model of Biowice Forest, so the Polish forest. And in that picture, you've got the Polish ambassador, the Polish um, uh, boss of the forest, plus Lutteg and, and several other people. Now, if I can get you to put a pointer on East Prussia, which is that separated red dot on the top right of my screen. Yeah, that's East Prussia. Now, the forest is in the yellow area below where it says Unter Deutsche Bewaltung. You see that? Yeah. Yellowy kind of round thing there to the, yes, just there. That's where the forest is. Now, if you look at the red border that goes to the outside of East Prussia, uh, the Bewaltung, and further down the general government, that's going to be the new German border. And that's what Goering's mission is all about creating the Gross Deutschland. Now we're not in we're not in the world of Lebensraum, which is all this other yellow bits and and empire and conquest and what have you. What we're talking about is re restoring lost German borders to create the final German state within Hitler's empire. So that's why the hunting in that forest has been so important. Now we've gone on here to race and noble Germanic game. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before, I think in the SS talk, that they actually use the animals in the same way of measuring as you would human beings. So, you know, how they had all these um, devices for measuring Jewish noses and what have you. But they do exactly the same with these animals. Now, the crazy thing about all of this German hunting is they not only classify the animal, then they kill it, then they paint a picture of it when it was alive. <laughs> no, 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 it gets better. That animal was actually shot by Field Marshal von Brauchitsch in June, in July 1941 during Operation Barbarossa. Wow. So you would think, hang on a minute, you're supposed to be fighting a war. Well, you're going running around shooting animals. There's a story there. Not going to dwell on it maybe another time. So if we move on to the next one. So having hunted in the forest in 1937, Goering sends his foresters into the same forest because he obviously wants that territory now to be part of the new German frontier. He wants to liberate the forest of the Polish people, so he deports them. So hence you have the police with the foresters, with the hunters, burning the forest, uh, the, the the communities while throwing the people out, but they also start killing Jews and communists. And this is the link, and you see in the photograph there, you've got foresters and police and SS men committing mass murder in the area. And and the um, memorial there is to the Jews who were killed in, in August, 19, uh, August 1941. Um, they were all men 16 to 60. They were walked out of the of a village where they'd had a community since the 1600s and literally were wiped out. And the whole community of Jews in that territory were wiped out. Now, technically, in August 1941, the Deutsche Verwaltung became Berserk Biliostok and became part of East Prussia. So at that point, August 1941, Everything is settled. So we go to the next picture. Next slide, sorry. Now, come a year later, and Goering has now acquired a new political, his political identity from 1940, he's been made Rice Marshal. And he sets about killing Matador. Now, we know that on the 22nd of September, 1942, he killed Matador. Matador's skull and whatever, the pawns, are still in existence. But you can see that when they killed Matador, they date stamped it and they put his coat of arms on, that's Goering's coat of arms on that picture there. 
okay and it was and the animal was killed at Raminton. now what you see in that photograph is not only that Goering has is showing himself off as the master hunter of the state but with all the Luftwaffe there the Nazi cameras there this show is going live in a you know it's going to go to the cinemas it's being projected this is the story of of the great ritual sacrifice of this mighty animal to the national socialist cause but if we go to the next slide you can see why he's doing it well first of all that very day or week he's actually had the results from the medical experiments coming in from Dachau where the, the Luftwaffe and the SS have been working on uh, aviation um, experiments of freezing and atmospheric problems. That same week Heinrich Himmler came to him and told him about the banking arrangements with the Swiss to take the gold from the murdered Jews who are going into the final solution, Auschwitz, uh, Treblinka and the other extermination camps. The collection of all that gold is going into the into the banks and is going to be supported by the Swiss. At the same time, the Luftwaffe, the one we know of the Luftwaffe, the Stukas, they're leading the charge to Stalingrad. And meanwhile, back in Biovisha, the, the Polish forest, two little companies of troops suddenly move in to the forest uh, uh, and there they are in their wader boots. So the reason why you have a sacrifice is far greater than just killing an animal for ritual show. There's an awful lot of architecture, ideological architecture taking taking place that's putting all of that together. So if we, we just go to the next slide. Now, we've got to the stage where I've given you all the background to how we got there very rapidly and I know it's complex and, uh, and I know I've jumped over things, um, but we are in the period of 1942 when um, Hitler has signed the Bandenbekämpfung Doctrine and so we have to ask what's going on to be able to understand um, the activities that lead us to the search for the ordinary soldier and I'm going to go through these processes now which is Bandenbekämpfung Doctrine, archives, uh, archives mining, diesel recreations, uh, Auftrags Tactique Union. So if you like that was the background, now we're getting into it. And so here we see it. So Bandemik Kampfung Doctrine is introduced in 1942 and Himmler straight away produces a booklet. Now, if you look at the map, you can see all of those red patches are the rising uh, partisan movement in the Soviet occupied areas. And you can see that the whole area behind the German front lines is awash with partisans. So there had to be a response and it couldn't be to continue with the same old, you know, anti-partisan warfare. There had to be a more doctrinal approach to um, dealing with this problem. And as I discussed in previous slide, uh, uh, talk we had, Bandon became from doctrine became the thing. Now for the, for the Luftwaffe, Goering was ordered to push all of the operational training units within the Luftwaffe, the RAD and support units into the Polish occupied territories to conduct training in small unit tactics of Bandon Bekemfung. In other words, combating partisans. So that's why you get this, this movement in activity taking place at this very key moment in the war. So if we go just, to just to interrupt because you know sure. this is absolutely mesmerizing. People are loving it. The comments on the uh, on the sidebar. I won't read them because your head will explode with with pride. But um, it's maybe a, a, a stupid question. But why why the Luftwaffe for this role? Is it because there isn't anybody else, or they does Goring want it? Have they been selected? Just what what's the what's the reason? Okay, well, all of them are committed. All the training units are committed to working for the Bandami Kampfung. Uh, initiative so yeah. so tr ss troops in opera in training army troops luftwaffe Krieg, even the kriegsmarine the, the the navy troops are doing this um the rad um or i mean it's, it's, it's national policy effectively yeah hitler has signed a national policy on the 18th of august 1942 and thou shalt do it without exception 
what Goering does is jump slightly ahead of the game. So he's seen to be still in the play. But remember now, he's got a bit of competition here with Himmler and the SS. So he's setting his own agenda. So if we could just, if we're done, sorry. Did, uh, did, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, yeah, no, yeah. I'm so mesmerizing. So here's an oper operational training slide. And I'm, I'm, I'm putting together some images here to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Now, Neukölln is right on the Baltic coast, not far from Königsberg in East Prussia. And we know this area because it was where Eric Hartmann, who you can see lying in the sand there, um, shooting a gun. You know, the two riflemen. Well, he's the yeah. one. I think he's the one on the right. Right. Now, what's interesting here is that in operational training, we're not talking about taking young men from basic training up to operational training. We're taking people who've either been in operational training or have, have um, already been serving and putting them into a, into the replacement process yeah but while we're doing that we're also going to teach them how to kill partisans and the the ncos are critical in this story which is why i've got that nco firing a luger there these guys are going to determine the way things pan out so if we just move on now i grab a now to me, these lads look very young. Um, they've always looked young to me. Um, I think between two and a half thousand and five thousand went through this one military process. So if you assume there's like 300 of them, you can see how many troops are being passed through this system. I'm only focusing on one, and one has had all these troops pass through. Some of them were flak. Some of them were from flying institutions. Um, a huge number came from the Hermann Goering Panzer Division. So they'd already been trained, but now they were being given an extra bump of training. So it just gives you an idea of, of the complexion of who these young men are that I'm dealing with. And those lads um, came from some of the records that I was working with um, very early on in this process. So. I mean, they are boys, aren't they? I mean, the guy on the left there looks 15 or something. I mean, I, don't, I can't tell his real age, but I mean, they, they look, they, they look. We, we always say that about any troops we see in World War II, but these ones really, really do look very young. Like I yeah. said, you know, um, but you but can yeah. see the mix now of where they're coming from. Now, in January 1943, uh, Goering releases all of the manpower that he can from the flat units, flat regiments and battalions in Germany and replaces the men with Hitler Youth. So what you see in this process is this huge ramp up of, <laughs> of manpower that suddenly comes into the Luftwaffe command. Now I'll put it in red because, you know, like you could miss it even if it was in blue. But mm. the, 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 the point is that that's the main source of troops. But if we were to think that that was the only source, that's an, that's an error. That's just showing you the impact of the troop mix in one company. Okay. I could only do so many companies because the, 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 the um, documents have been so destroyed and damaged, what have you. So we're going to the next one. Um, there you can see the age profile. Now, the German soldiers are always about which year you're in. So the last year of troops coming into the German armed forces was 24. Um, so 23, 20, they're, they're, a, they're the main mix of the ordinary soldiers. Um, the 1917, a couple of them are officers, but mostly NCOs. There's a couple of older soldiers in there that came from the pay corps. Um, but in this process of cleaning people out, um, it's where they are. 1905, uh, at the far end, that's one of the officers. The officers are significantly older. Um, a lot of the junior NCOs, what I would call the Oberjägers, because the, the Luftwaffe uses this terminology for its rifle regiments. Um, those lads are 
two or three years old, and I always wonder whether they mix with the young boys. You, you know, there's that that three or four years difference between the ordinary group soldiers and the first ranks of the corporals, as you know, lance corporal equivalent, lance corporal and bombardier, mm. that kind of level. You wonder whether there's a gap, and it's significant. Yeah, well, well, when you if you've got two groups of people who are twenty six and thirty, that difference is very negligible. But eighteen, nineteen, twenty two, twenty three is a much bigger leap at the time. And I remember when I was 18, people in their early 20s seemed very, very different generation to me. So, yeah, it's uh, I, I see what I'm, I'm fascinated by where this is all leading to. I know where it's all leading to, but it's it's, it's really, really, your, your, your research is just fabulous. Okay. <laughs> that was a bit of a show stuff. Anyway, go, go, <laughs> going on. So, these are the two units. Now, I'm not going to linger because all of these units, that, that, that one lasts for six months, the other one lasts for two years uh, or just under two years. The, the point is, this is the kind of documentation that you're dealing with. These two, these two war diaries happen to survive. 99% of most Luftwaffe war diaries disappeared. Uh, I just put them there so people could see, you know. Mm. Uh, if we move on now in this process um and i think this is perhaps critical for people who are trying to understand where i'm coming from because the luftwaffe archives were destroyed in may 1945 and almost what what was left was shredded too you've had i've had to go through a whole load of different archives following different decision trees so for example um, you can see that there's whatever it is, 11 different archives here um, bearing different fruit. Now, one's interesting is the Museum for uh, Naturkunde in Berlin, believe it or not, is a natural history museum where I found out the files about Adolf Garland. Mm. So you, you think oh, these sources, these mining from all of these archives is speculative. Actually, to get to that, I actually had to read his, um, occup his uh, interrogation papers where he talked about being here, there and everywhere. And I picked up on that, that he was talking about hunting just off the cuff. Before he got to the book, he was talking about hunting. And I thought, hmm, interesting. So we started to look through a lot of the uh, hunting journals during the, the wartime period, and we found him. Yeah. And he told the story there that he didn't tell later. Now I'm going to go on, but I just wanted to show that archives, when you're searching for documentation, you really do have to spread and you really go and mm -hmm. have to look around. Otherwise, you can't reconstruct all the missing pieces. Uh, and all of those archives were mined for huge amounts of info. Uh, no ridiculous I, question, uh, Philip, but, you know, 15 work years. Um, did you know you were, you know, when you're like three years into it, for example, at that point, did you know you were going to find enough? Because, you know, you go into all these archives. At what point did you realize you had enough to make a, a work out of this? Because what if you got to so many dead ends, you realized you, you couldn't bring these threads together, you couldn't bring this work together? Or do you, would you just have kept on going until it until it did? No. What, what you do is you come to a point where you say enough. It's not going to happen, even though you've got all the documentation. So in... Um, it was about January 2010, a colleague at the US Holocaust Museum said, look, it might not be going anywhere. Why don't you just write an article so at least catch your breath? And we produced an article pre all the GIS and mapping and all of that stuff. And that kind of focused attention and we said to ourselves, that's it, can't go any further, done. And then of course, um, things changed from then. We found all of the information that, that we wanted by 2009. The problem was joining it up and making sense of it because we still didn't have the, 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 um, the device to bring us all together. So yes, I had all of that, 
there's okay there's a couple of documents from the russian archive which i picked up a, about a year ago but mostly all of that was all in place the problem was how to put it together and make meaningful sense of it because okay we had the strands about garland we had the strands about flavor but we had no way of putting them all together that mm. was the problem mm. that's why we had to go down the road that we did which we'll which we'll get to in due course so well in fact we're getting to right now aren't we so this is the yeah i'll hand back to you but this this is absolutely mesmerizing people are loving it i'm i'm just transfixed so um yeah this and 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 the sec i, I yeah, this this is going to blow people's minds. This this is the process here. So um, yeah, back to you. I my partner is a gear specialist, and I've I've said all along it was all of the work that she has done to be able to map and produce stuff. And so where we're going to here is is largely a partnership because the historical gear element. Okay, I, I did some reading. I did a, I, I attended a whole load of courses for about two years. I studied GIS, but I'm not a technician. I just needed to know the understand the principles of it. My aim was to do the mapping of the ordinary soldier in killing. Yes. So uh, let's make this clear. I, I did the work. I did the process, but I didn't do the technocrat stuff. And mm. that that is really hard work. And I I'm going to explain that now as we go along. But now the point of what's going to happen in this is a bit is a bit of a shock for a lot of historians because what you're actually saying is it's a demise of maps with flags. Now, this might sound radical. The idea for that term came from Richard Holmes. It was Richard who was getting very frustrated with the idea that flags on maps don't work anymore. They don't tell the story. And if you look at the pictures of Stalingrad, you know those are a moment, but it's only that moment when that map is drawn. Now, the German army is producing 25,000 maps on the Eastern Front at Army Group Center every day with units in every position and mm. their movement. So if they've moved an inch on the map, then the next map the next day shows that inch. But they're still going to be a day behind the movement of the troops. You know? that reflects in military history because you you're forever trying to get the right number of maps to the the right story and so what we found by using gis was actually this suddenly becomes redundant the paper map becomes redundant and to and to a certain extent there's a danger there because you lose a lot of skills so mm. so i say that with reluctance there's a danger in that slide yeah, the demise of the maps with flags. Yes, on the one hand, it sounds good. But on the other hand, there's the potential danger that you lose the idea, which is why in the book, I think I use the term uh, reading maps like German soldiers. You do, yeah. And, and holding on to that skill of being able to look at a map as a German soldier. So if we... I think just, just worth, you, for those who are watching this who don't know who Richard Holmes is, Sir Richard Holmes, he was very influential in your career. He was... Well, influential in many of us, our careers, the prolific author, TV historian, you know, d died. We lost him a, a number of years ago, but actually for his, for his generation, he was very forward thinking, wasn't he? I mean, he did new things with TV. He did new, new things with writing. And I think, you know, he, he has, he, we would label him as being from a generation in the past, but actually I think he would fit, he would slot well in if he was back here now with the Victoria Taylors of the world and those other people who are, who are using these new skills going forward, because he, he was very visionary, I think, in that regard. Yes. In fact, funny enough, earlier today, um, during my, shall we say, minor hangover moment, <laughs> I was watching, <laughs> I was watching um, Soldiers, which he produced with mm. Keegan in the 80s. And I'm, I luckily enough have a copy of it. And I was, watching what he was talking about with the infantry soldier because obviously we're talking about it here and it just reminded me how advanced he was yeah even in the 80s yeah yeah absolutely yeah so we're, yeah we'll get into for those who, have, who, are, who are, want to know what we're actually talking about there um geographic information system but yeah we'll, we'll hand back to you to explain this this new technology that was that was the 
the key to you unlocking this mystery? Right. The map behind was the Luftwaffe map of the territory, one section. Now, if you can imagine, when we printed the, the six maps off, they were as big as a seminar room, a decent seminar room. So to actually understand what was going on on those maps, you literally had to crawl across about six foot just to find the village that you're looking for. Well, that was impossible. So we, Bettina and I went to um, the Mammalian Institute in Biavisha, which is where they do all kinds of cartographical and mammal research and local terrain in the forest. And they surprised us with uh, a number of Polish maps from the 20s and 30s. And what Bettina did was piece that structure together. And the map on the right-hand side is the digital map of the whole terrain that we call the Biavisha Arena, where the black line is, that's a security area um, going around that whole area with all the principal cities and towns and villages. So what you actually have is you created or recreated a digital battlefield. It looks like a, an ordinary map, but actually you can do all sorts of things with it. And, and the things that you can do with it are, are dropping layers. So let's say you have a layer of a division or a company or whatever, you can just layer it on top of the map and you can move it almost real time. So if, if we go on to the next one, I'll show you. So this is July 1942, the arrival of the 1st Battalion of Operational Training Troops into their initial deployment in the forest. Now. On the left hand side, you can see that the forest has got troops. So it's got the green of the Luftwaffe, uh, of, of the German army, and you've got the black, which is the SS, uh, controlling a ghetto down in the south. And the blue rings are the Luftwaffe coming in and being overlaid onto the territory of the map. Now, that's the big issue. That's the big story with all the activity going on. But if you actually drill down then and look at the two companies as they've come in, you can see how they were distributed within the forest. Now, what that picture isn't telling you that I can tell you is that they are guarding the, the main lumber industries and forestry points at one section, which is in the green, and then in the blue or pink colour, they're guarding the the hunting sites where the where bison and all this sort of animals are being reared and um, rebreeded and what have you. So they're going in with a mission, and that's July 1942. And actually, they're pretty awful, but that's another story we can come back to. It. But they're that the, those troops are not well thought of and. They're going in with Belgium, First World War Belgium rifles. So any idea that somehow the Luftwaffe is getting beneficial gear, you throw that out the window. They haven't got machine guns. They've got no transport. They don't know where they're going. They arrive late. They are a complete and utter mess. Uh, and then they're given command to a, a, of a soldier who doesn't know why they're there. <laughs> and it's just one catastrophe after another. Anyway. Let's just move on to the next one. Now, Goering takes a senior security officer out of the southeast region area, I think from Croatia, and has a long discussion with him. And the officer says, well, to cover this area, which is 256,000 hectares of land, which is several times larger than the Shenandoah Valley, you need so many companies to come in and you spread them in such a way and you run patrols between them. Now, to do this, they actually had to raise lit companies literally every month. So it was a, it was a rolling system. And, and what you actually see is the development of how those companies are coming in. Now, key to our talk are the ones in red and green because those are the sixth and fourth companies which come in at the latter part in in the you know you can see them emerging in november and then fully developed in december 
But you can also see that they're lined up they're down at the southeast side. You can see a little red dot, and that's a Jewish ghetto. And that Jewish ghetto is going to be destroyed. So you can actually see that the as the SS are planning the destruction of the ghetto, the Luftwaffe is putting security troops in place in preparation so that nobody is escaping from that camp and getting into the forest and escaping from the Holocaust. So you see a battalion build up, companies coming into a forest. What you don't see until you start piecing it all together is that it's pre-planning towards a Holocaust outcome. Okay. So if we go on to the next one. Now, what we did here is to show how that there's a concept in German military thinking called Auftrags Taktik, which is the mission command. And, and I've noted their mission command. I've taken it from uh, a good friend's book, um, Jeff Rutherford, who I think we all know is on Twitter. Uh, and Jeff and his colleague Adrian um, put up a, what I think is probably one of the clearest, <laughs> the clearest references to how Auftrag Taktik works. And essentially, Patrols are left to the NCO to run an operation. Let's get it simple. And what we tried to do with the patrols was to take the information from the war diaries and from the military reports and then digitize them into layers and lay them on your digital map. So what you're seeing now are all the different companies running patrols across the forest and what you do notice is that they're running very close to each other and they're not going back they're going in one direction and you can see that they're even coming out of the forest where there's a, a just below that dot on the red there there is a, a ghetto so they're actually coming from very close to the ghetto and running back and <laughs> this is this was fascinating to find that they're not running towards the camps, the ghettos, they're running away from them because they're actually tracking the footprints in the snow. That's what they're doing. So we were able to build up a picture. And as you know, also notice, they're crossing. So there's a, the, the, the patrols are running to a pattern. Nobody is going to escape into this forest. Really. If they do, they're really, really lucky, but they're not, and they're gonna get caught. At the same time, the Soviets who are uh, partisans, who are trying to bed into the forest over for the, you know, for the winter hibernation period when there's, there's no activity, they're going to <laughs> walk into Luftwaffe patrols. On top of all of that, believe it or not, they start to deport people again so you've got <laughs> you, you you're thinking you're dealing with operational training but you're suddenly dealing with all these other subjects mm. uh, missions you know minor missions all parts of a bigger mission and the bigger mission is to train these guys in half charge tactic and 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 that's why it becomes very complex and that's uh -oh. why you see, we couldn't put that I couldn't do that research without GIS because it just mm. would not relieve the act. It would not reveal the activities. Yeah, you wouldn't better visualize it, would you? You, you? you just your brain would be overloaded. But a question for Marion Walters there, just saying about did the transport reports provide data for these layers as well? Yes. And if we go to the next map, I think it's the next one. Um, no, but here you can see the body count, so you can actually see. Uh, I'll come. I'll come back to Marion's question in a minute, if you don't mind. I thought it was the next no one. Here you can actually see where there's been contact. And in 1942-43, those are winter contacts. So all of those red, um, uh, yes, yeah, all of those are contacts, and they've killed somebody. Okay. Um, it could be Jews. It could be partisans mostly in this mostly in this map that we drew they're partisans and you can see that they're staying in a certain kind of area 
where there's transport, um, there's food, probably a little bit of um, housing like uh, in, in the forest, they have bunkers where they put potatoes and wood for the winter, the local communities, and people will live in them. If you look at here now, up at this side, you can see there's slightly more going on on the right-hand side where there's um, swamps. And people have just confirmed in the sidebar just how unhospitable that part of the world is. You know, it's mosquitoes kill you between or bite you between April and October. Then the rest of the year, it's just freezing cold. It's not. It, it's it's a horrible, not horrible. If you live there, I guess it's your it's your home. But it's a, it's a difficult part of the of the world to live in. Uh, I, I told the story, I think, of turning on a light bulb and the room was full of insects in seconds. Um, wow! And and then at night. I walked away from the hotel just to get a sense, just to get a sense of the darkness. And it was it was just incredible. I mean, the, the light just shuts down and you've got nothing. Um, so it's a it's a winter time. No, no, no. That is winter is actually horrible because it's that cold that gets right through you. Mm. And I was fit then. <laughs> I was very yeah, cold. well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Shall I move on? Yeah, go, go on to the next one. Now, here oh, we, yeah, deportations, yeah. The, right. the, here's the transport. So I, I should have got them the other way around. My fault. But what you can see here is how they're picking on an area, deporting the people, and you can see the transport routes out. And they're depositing the people into other communities without any kind of rhyme or reason. Now, this community here in the Reds, they're the ones which are being moved in the 1942-43 period. So at the same time that they're running exercises against the partisans, the Jews, they're also moving this community. And so the Luftwaffe troops are running actual uh, evacuation, deportation convoys out using horses mostly, taking the people out of the forest. And dropping them in places like Bialystok or other towns. Now, the ones that they drop into Bialystok, this is how, this is this is the kind of thinking that you're having to deal with. As the Jews are being taken out of the ghetto in Bialystok, which is about 75 kilometers up the road, these poor people are being put into their houses. So they've been deported from their homes to put in homes of people who are being deported to extermination camps. Now, I can't imagine anything worse. Um, and although there's been great effort to uh, socialize and they get letters from Goering saying they're having, they're going to have nice homes and all the rest of it. I think once they arrived in Bialystok, they were going to learn some horror because only the year before the synagogue had been um, raised on and, and burnt down with many Jews inside. So those kinds of stories to a community of people who, who, who you know, farm workers and labourers and what have you, suddenly coming into this, uh, the whole, it's it, it just mind boggling. And what you see is all of this effort to depopulate the, the forest. Well, for, you, 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 OK, that's mad enough. But the grey area right in the middle, that, that actual little spot right in the grey area in the middle um, between the red and the, and the green and the black, that little area where the, yeah, just where you put your finger, just there, you actually start seeing new communities of Germans coming in. So they've, <laughs> they're, throwing every, they're throwing all of these people out and then they're putting people in. And the people are not exactly pure German stop there some of them are polish people who've said yeah we're germans and anything to stop from being killed or played in camps and what have you so you've got this repopulation taking place against depopulation and you've got the chief foresters saying that they're turning this into a wilderness and you've got the luftwaffe saying we're turning it into a community and you know on that level of uh, of change and 
and, and different opinions and chaos, you can't map it. You can only say, well, look, <laughs> that's all of that going on at the same time all of this is going on. Um, mm. So hence why we had to do these maps. So the GIS is really reinforcing all the time the evidence that you're gleaming now, because as the more, you know, you're asking me, what would, what did I do with all this information? Well, now suddenly all of this information is building layer after layer after layer. And the information is building up and building up and, and you're seeing a more clear picture of how this whole occupation is taking place and how security works with the Luftwaffe and how operational training works. And they're all intermingled with all of this uh, main national policy of Goering to turn this border into a secure zone incredible stuff now what you can do with gis which you can't do with anything else is isolate individuals into what they do and here this map actually shows individual jews who've been um, intercepted uh, and killed or captured or arrested um, if they were arrested, they were taken back to the town of Biavisha because, okay, it's the forest of Biavisha, but the main town there, and they were executed in the market square. Um, many, um, in many occasions, they were just murdered and left. Uh, and there's this thing in the what the Germans do, they're not taking burial parties, so the bodies are just left. And it's hard to decide, it's hard to describe whether they've left the bodies there as a warning for Jews not to come in, or um, they're hoping that the forest, because, you know, forests uh, recycle human material and animal waste and what have you, um, they're hoping that that kind of natural, whatever you call it, takes place. What you do notice is where all of those individuals are. Because if you look to the, if you look, they're all very much in the vicinity of the ghetto. So mm. it's people who have tried to escape and you can see where they've been intercepted. You can almost see with the, with the diagrams as it's cutting across, you can see how they've cut across a patrol path and that they've been intercepted in, if you like, in the trawler nets of these security yeah. roles. Yeah? yeah. Now, in all of this, you know, why are they doing it? Well, frankly, they're treating the Jews like vermin. And we're back to that problem again, which is they just shoot them, they just kill them, they just leave them, they're not interested. But for, for us, what we're talking about here is it's the NCOs who are leading this. And they're normalizing the violence of those young soldiers that we were looking at before and saying, OK, you've killed, we move on. So it's normalizing. That's a, that has a big impact on German soldiers if this is going to be a regular thing. Yeah. Mm. And how much of that normalizing do you think is because of their isolation? You know, they're, they're you know, we're not we're, when we talk about German troops in Normandy or German troops other Rome or something, you know, you've got girls and drink and these guys are going to be incredibly isolated in, a, in an environment that is not very pleasant to be in so all you've got is your brother soldier your 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 fellow troops there with you to, to, to become your own kind of family so if something like this horrible e horrible murder of escaping Jews starts becoming normal like it, it's they're falling back and it's the only thing that's uniting them I suppose it's weird I, I, it's weird you see, the thing, the thing is, there's no evidence of any um, refusal. There's no evidence of naughty behavior. Th this is, all, all the evidence is showing operational training base. So in any operational training base at any time, troops are going to be isolated anyway. We have one case where one of the soldiers drank too much and he was put on a charge. And when I work back from that, um, that there were bars, that they did have um, drinking facilities and, you know, casinos and these places. There was also evidence of engagements with women because although I didn't have them in the records, I found photographs of Luftwaffe men with local girls. So, mm. so 
they're not as isolated okay. as you would imagine. Yeah, because actually we're in Germany. I know this sounds crazy. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to add to your to the picture there, all of the all of the senior forestry officials, hunters, and some of the officers bring their wives in and their children. Yeah. So it's it, it's like a community within the operational training, within a fighting zone. So you're fighting. <laughs> They do actually fight the partisans, and, and we'll look at one in a minute. But it's it's like a community of an ordinary operational training area. Mm. Well, well, we're moving on, I guess. So, um, yeah. So, so just to show you how detailed you can and you can drill down with GIST, this is an actual individual soldier killing Jews. And what actually happens here is N... Corporal Nonning is on a patrol and he's leading from Okalinki up to Bialy Lasik. And somewhere in his patrol area, 500 meters away, in that radius, he sees five Jews and he sees them against the tree line. So I assume, I assume, I don't know, that he's actually seen them against the tree line where B is, which is the bunker. The Jews are running to the bunker, an underground bunker, where there's a large community. He's seen them, and with his rifle, he's opened fire. Now, why this story is, is relevant is not just the fact that we can drill down and show in detail one incident of killing and name the people involved. It's the fact that, that having done this, having created the hunt to the bunker, and a hunt of their whole area and killing 25 Jews afterwards. Nonning was mentioned in dispatches. Mm. And it's the only time when <laughs> musketry was put forward as this outstanding achievement within the dispatch military dispatches. They didn't give him an they didn't give him a medal. They didn't say, oh, you know combat assault badge or any of that stuff but they did actually recognize that what he had done was an outstanding achievement because he had killed five jews on the fly rapid fire wow. so we are in we are in a strange we're in a strange marriage here between military efficiency and holocaust level killing because mm. he hasn't walked up to them and shot them in the head or by a ditch. And that's why it's been glorified within the file. What I couldn't understand is why there were no others. I don't believe he was the only one. But that one story was held. Mm. And, and I'm just my takeaway right now, Philip, is just we talked a little bit about it in the Holocaust week about the, the separation of the Holocaust aspect of world war two from the, the, the battlefield part of world war two. And essentially part of what you're doing is, is, is bringing those two back together again and, and reminding us it's all the same. It's all the same era. And people are already commenting in the, about the fact that we associate the Holocaust with the, you know, the Ukrainian guards of the constant of the death camps and the, the and this is this is military units being wholly part of something that as well and, and it all ties back to Goring's ambitions Goring's kind of rival not rivalry with Himmler but he's trying to make his claim as as a important part of the ideology as well it, there's there's lots of themes you're 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 bringing together with this and uh, it, it is absolutely yeah mesmerizing um the, 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 the thing you've got here is I, and I have to say this, I never actually, once I got involved in the Holocaust, I never actually believed that there was a separation. I always thought that this idea that there was this artificial difference, um, it just seemed wrong to me. It, it, early on, when somebody once pointed out to me that the flak units assigned to Auschwitz were from the Luftwaffe I already thought hang on how does that work and then once you start building up from that like the trains going into Auschwitz the engine drivers 
the the crews that are going taking the trains on the extermination trains then you've got the people who plan the trains and i know i'm mentioning trains anybody thinks i'm a lulu on choo choos but it's the, the it's it's the infrastructure that goes with it and that you find luftwaffe troops in auschwitz really why then you find luftwaffe troops in dachau running experiments on jewish per personnel then you find Jewish personnel being taken from Buchenwald to work at the ME262 and 109 factories. And suddenly the picture's built, you know, where is this all going to stop? Hmm. How, how, where's this idea that there's a separation of, of killing? Doesn't work. Well, I, have to try, I, I don't really know where that idea even started. It would be fascinating to do a separate show, a panel discussion, something about when, when did... We're talking about Holocaust studies and World War II studies joining again, but when did they start separating? That's a question that I'm now pondering. Um, I mean, definitely, I, I, when I go into bookshops, there's definitely kind of a shelf of Holocaust stuff, and then you get into the shelf of, of wartime stuff. But what is that? I don't know how much in, of that is the, the booksellers. Is that the, the public? I don't know. It's, it's an interesting subject. We, we will tackle in the future, I, I promise. I think it's good that Holocaust studies has developed. But often Holocaust studies forgets that it took hap it happened in the war and it kind of misses this stuff. It, 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 it's, a, it's a problematic for both military historians and Holocaust students to put back together again and say, you know, we, we've, we really do need to put all of the war back into its box with the Holocaust, the military, all working as they worked and not separate activities. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, well, we can talk about that again. But, yeah, so uh, it's, it's, getting, it's, it's getting grimmer in the sense of the subject matter, but getting more gripping in the sense of how, how spellbinding this is. But let, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Well, back in the 90s, I, I met and worked uh, fairly closely, but not directly under uh, Joanna Burke. And... Joanna Burke had produced this book on face-to-face -face killing, the intimacy of killing in the 20th, 20th century. And she posits the argument that one of the things about soldiering in the 20th century was killing. My, and I have two counters to that. I think most soldiers want to survive. I think they don't go to war to die. They go or, or, or so much kill. They want to see through the war. They want to come out alive and if preferable, preferably in one piece but doing the work that i've been doing with the luftwaffe and then before that the ss it struck me that face-to-face -face killing leads to something called a confrontation with death because if you pick up a rifle and shoot somebody there's a good chance you're going to get shot and killed and that two-way calculation isn't always apparent in the way we look at face-to-face -face killing yeah so what I wanted to do in this slide was not just to refer um, the importance of this scholar. And I think Joanna Burke has really pushed an idea there, which is very important. And we tend to overlook it. Yeah? She did a lot of good work then, and it, it's kind of got sidelined, and I wanted to bring it back. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll show you what I mean. Now, in one of these inexplicable areas of the forest is the swamps and up until 1943 when Walter Fravor you know the guy at the beginning who produced the honor code and what have you he came along and said you're going to hunt partisans like you would hunt wild animals so he's got the troops running into the most craziest of places as he ramps up the, no the notion of Alftrag's tactic in a violent, aggressive way, of course, one bunch of NCOs lead an operation. And what we're showing here is how that operation, the patrol, shifted through a whole area trying to find this partisan group. And when they found them, they found them in a swamp and they charged them like you would a i don't know an infantry charge from the great war and they ran straight into two machine guns and they were wiped out so although you've got the ncos 
leading these troops into Aftrag's tactic and casual killing and everyday killing and murdering and all the rest of it, there is an element of ineptitude. And it comes up many times, to be honest. Um, and it, it's all under that 43 going into 44 period when Freybert was in charge and he's pushing this hunt ideology. And hunting ideology on its own doesn't work in soldiering. Yeah. So, if we go on to the next slide, um, this gives you an idea of the casualty figures. And as you can see, very uh, in the early days, they've had a few dead, but not many. <laughs> By the time Fravert comes along, the numbers of dead suddenly start rocketing. And they're at specific times when he's trying to get medals and he's trying to get his promotion. I mean, that, that large one there, it's all about the time when he's trying to get promotion to major. So he's got them all running around going crazy. Um, it backfires. It backfires. They do, they do actually investigate him and say, you know, this is inept. Um, and there is a suggestion that Goering, under pressure, looks for a a number two to come in and uh, a young forestry Luftwaffe officer turns up um, in mid 19, uh, end of mid 1943. And he looks like a capable soldier running the operations, but uh, maybe another day with him. So if we go mm -hmm. on to the next one. Just, just quickly, Philip, I mean, how much of a close eye or is, is Goring putting on this operation? I mean, there's lots of things going on, 43, 44. But, I mean, is this something he's following intently, kind of weekly reports, daily reports, once a month? What, what's your take on exactly how much, uh, how important it is to him? He's getting um, average a weekly report. It goes to his um, uh, liaison aide-de-camp. It goes to a man called uh, Nicholas Brauchich, who's the cousin or nephew of the field marshal who shot the stag. Um, Brouchish reports these figures uh, to Goering as soon as they come in because you actually have messages from Goering coming back into the forest ordering Fravert or the previous major in command, a man called Emil Herbst. Emil Herbst is constantly referring to discussions with Goering. There are counter records showing that Goering discussed with him. Uh, Goering negotiated um, on body counts. Goering supplied troops, Goering supplied Hermann Goering division troops um, specific to certain exercises and certain operations. Um, Goering supplied, uh, for the 1943-44 period, he even included a, a strategic network so that they could use backpack signals systems, you know, the, what do you call it, mm. the wireless radios, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which meant that they could be in the field longer. Then they so a lot is the, is the simple answer. Thank you for that. But the answer is he's he's heavily involved in this on a personal level. He's very interested and in, yeah, brilliant, um, brilliant information. Um, we'll move on. So yeah, and this is this is now the in, the, the breakdown of injuries. And I, when you sent me the PowerPoint and I was having a peruse of it, I did laugh out loud at the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was reading. Is... I was watching someone on YouTube today. It was um, a Dan Snow broadcast. It was interviewing someone who was a sort of a interested uh, from Whores of Yore, the Twitter account about sex and the, and one of uh, the euphemisms in the nineteenth century when someone was stabbed or shot or had an accident in their ass. It was called the the, the use, press used to refer to it as the fleshy part of the thigh. That was how. <laughs> if you read, if ever you read anything in a nineteenth-century crime report about the person was stabbed in the fleshy part of the thigh, it's the ass, folks. That's where <laughs> they've actually been. Stabbed. But you, but you've just put it there bluntly, the ass shot, which I think, yeah, it's it's kind of relaxed. It's been a grim subject. That's just kind of you've you've relaxed the, the room there. It's we can we can build up to the grimness again. <laughs> the the. Okay, well, let's just leave the grim for a while out for a second and just focus on that R shot. That R shot is a reflection of tra soldiers in training. Mm. It's it's the guy picking up his rifle the wrong way and shooting his mate in front of him. It, it's, it's the guy who's supposed to be on patrol. 
he stuck his bottom out in the middle of a bush. He then pokes his gun out the other way. The machine gunner thinks he's the enemy, so he actually gets shot in the bum by his mate. Um, they are crazy ass shots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's not much more you can say. Um, and then the sharp weapon, did you? do you think that is wounding by someone with a bayonet of his own friend or, or is that yeah, an enemy an enemy inflicting or a bit of both they're all not those are all caused by partisans okay uh and that mostly all post-mortem uh hacking uh one 19 year old was sliced in half um from the neck down to the side so from this side right across um and we think that was with a scythe um wow what one young one young man was stabbed in the head and upper area so all of that part uh they they found 19 wounds wow the the the, the casualty figures were kept by the Luftwaffe field hospital in Bialystok, a reserve field lazarette and all of their records are in were, were complete so we could actually drill down and work out the kind of things that the troops were suffering from. So, for example, on patrol, most of the soldiers were shot from the neck up because as they as because the ground is all uneven, what have you, as they as they got to the top of the brown, their heads are showing the, the partisans waiting for them always took a quick shot and be off. So shoot and scoop mm. and they'd shoot them in the neck or in the head. So you get all these head kind of wounds, this area here. Um, a few were blown up. Two officers were blown up. Sire was blown up in 1942 while he was on a patrol. Uh, he was going around paying all the troops. He, was the com he wasn't the company paymaster. He was one of the junior officers in the fourth company. And he was driving around to pay them their salaries. And um, he was blown up and then machine gunned um, in in uh, retribution the Luftwaffe destroyed a village and killed somewhere in the region 300 people okay so there is there is that kind of retribution going on i didn't want to go too much detail in that because that kind of inflames the situation it was a it was a direct response to the killing of one officer another officer who was blown up they didn't bother they didn't do anything so again mm -hmm as I was saying to you before, there's no consistency here. You're constantly with different different responses, different actions, different takes on situations. Should we go on? Yeah. So there is a mapping the dead. Um, and while this sounds very strange, I know, um, but when I went to look for the dead soldiers, which had... Um, had been buried originally in the forest uh, in the military cemetery when we went to look for them i actually had drew gilpin's book and she, she's written this fantastic study of of death in the american civil war so i wanted to mention it because although it's not my period well it is my period because i'm particularly interested in the american civil war but it's not my period for the research but what it did was set a structure of how you should look at death in war and military history and what what this set of pictures shows is two soldiers who were killed in the forest in the 43 period and you can see them uh, adams was one of those young boys that you saw a picture of he was shot as i said in the neck um around about june the 5th nine uh, i think it's june the 5th yeah june the 5th 1943 byrick was the senior signals officer that was sent from Lufgau Eins in Königsberg, you know, this major senior office of the Luftwaffe administration. Bayrick was the senior signals officer for the what would be a, a piece in the whole uh, communications network throughout the Reich. And he went out on a patrol, didn't even think to take an escort with him and was shot. The memorial in red is the memorial to the village that was destroyed with the 300 people. And that was been, that's actually been put into the site where the German military cemetery was. 
And that glorious picture of me when I had a bit more hair than I have now is me pointing a finger at Siegfried Adams' grave. And you can see that just the corner there. And that's Siegfried Adams who was killed in May 1943. So that's the direct connection. And, and that really, that slide was just about how you map the dead and how you mm -hmm. hunt them. Yeah. So just when you think all of this has gone, quote, tits up or pear shaped or whatever you think, we, <laughs> I found all this record of the fighting retreat from Bagrat Tsiung, you know, the German, the, mm -hmm. the Soviet operation slamming into the Eastern Front. And you would think, given that the Soviets have, have smashed into Army Group Center and are taking, I think they took, was it somewhere in the region of 500,000 um, prisoners of war and dead? Oh, it's insane, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's a huge attack on, on, the, on Army Group Center, which literally implodes. Well, it took nearly two weeks for Army Group Center, uh, Army Group Center, um, the Soviet troops having smashed through the front lines of Army Group Center to arrive at this forest. And when they did, the battalion fought a fighting retreat. Now, this is astonishing because it was a senior NCO called Koenig. And I don't know who he is. I don't know what he, is, what he looks like. I've got no pictures. The only record I've got are these combat reports in the war diary and so I've taken a picture of an NCO and I've blacked out the face just to say, well, you know, there's a uniform. But the story of Koenig was so dramatic in the sense that he held together the cohesion of the remains of the battalion. The, the young man who'd come in as an officer in 43 was killed. And he took over the battalion. There were about, at that stage, 200 of them. And he got them back. And he, he didn't just, you know, well, we're going to retreat now, like um, Corporal Steiner runs through the forest um, in the film A Cross of Iron. He actually fights, and he's killing Soviet tanks while at the same time being bombarded by rockets and causing these endless casualties to all of these Russian soldiers in the now Soviet cemetery in Hanovka. And I'm looking at all of these... Russian soldiers, and they've all died at the time when senior officer NCO, sorry, uh, Koenig, has been fighting them. I mean, that, that was truly astonishing. And then I compared Koenig to the, the picture of the German NCO, the German army NCO, who's very famous. I don't know if you've ever come across him before. But he's actually the role model for Corporal Steiner in Cross of Iron. And that is uh, Johann Schwerdfeger. And he got the Knight's Cross for running a charge against some tanks and was wounded in the process. And I think he survived the war. Okay. But that's one attack. Koenig, he, he's spending like three weeks getting these boys home fighting. And he's stealing, you know, he's taking captured ammunition and captured equipment to keep the fight going. His machine guns, because they're the old 0815s from the Great War, slightly manufactured, they're jamming in the Polish soil. And he's fighting. And as he's, and as he's doing this, junior lieutenants who are under his command, because he's clearly the, the, he's really being given the chap, you know, he's been given control because he is so highly respected. They're saying how good he is. Wow. Well. And, and yet nobody gets anything. There's no rewards. And he just disappears from the story. So having gone through this process of murdering and horror and what have you, you suddenly find that this little battalion that has been going around murdering people suddenly perform like hot soldiers, making the whole the original story of, you know, Cross of Iron, the Willing Flesh. Willy Heinrich um, thing, um, rather tame. I was astonished, yeah. and kind of yeah, and and that's the level of confusion you've got now. That is, I think, and this is only my opinion, and having spoken to a, an old soldier 
who pretty much was my um, sounding board on all of these ideas. I think the reason why the German soldiers after the war could only remember the, the period 1944-45 and not the earlier periods was because of this kind of operation. That they were so hard fighting, they were so hard pressed, that what happened before was just forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd, you'd want. Yeah, that makes absolute sense, especially when the the writing is on the wall in the sense the Germans are going to be losing the war. So you know, you're kind of. It's better to to leave or be captured, whether your fate is going to be as a German soldier talking about your heroic last stand as a fighting soldier than it is dwelling on the the rather more dubious past you've had in the previous two years. It's it's for your own kind of mental health, even though these people are bastards, some of them. I can understand why they're re reevaluating their experiences. Um yeah, it's it, it and which 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 is bringing us, I guess, to your to your conclusions. Uh which yeah. So what with the mapping we were able to do was if you again we go back to those questions we're now filling in that box with the, the sorry, the circle with the, the question mark with um, with the constants, which are fighting power. So we have fighting power, we have race ideology, we have military dogma, Luftwaffe culture, but dramatically non-primary group. So you think that all of these guys are going to go off together and be fighting unit in, I don't know, Hermann Goering, Panzer, they're not. They're broken off and they're sent to all these different places so they're not a primary group yet when they're put together for a short period they fight like a primary group mm -hmm. and i think that's another story that we you know we've always assumed that it's the primary group you know the shields and janovitz kind of attitude you know the wehrmacht collapse and how it wasn't was i think what i found was quite the opposite that you could as long as the NCO and the command structure was solid, they could get a whole bunch of troops to do almost anything. And that includes killing Jews in the in the forest or fighting a rearguard action aggressively. Um, and, and I think you're, you're downplaying a little bit because you're a humble guy, just how groundbreaking this work is because there, there are people have ideas about how the evil aspect of the third Reich was managed. And it tends to be kind of the, the Heydrichs and the Himmlers. And, but you're saying the NCO is integral to this. Um, and, and we've talked about their, their relative age, you know, 23, 24, 25. These aren't, this, this is, this is quite, quite revolutionary. What you're, what you've come up with here, Phil. Oh, okay. I think so. Yeah, I mean, just incredible stuff. I mean, it is people are, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm struggling to kind of put all my thoughts together because you've, you've, you've raised lots of questions, answered lots of questions, but you've also stimulated the more questions that I will have moving forward. Well, if I can just, just, let me just say, what you have the your constants in actual action are, if you look on the blue, You've got the operational training, the Auftrags tactic, and the cohesion. Right? So that's that's just solid military operations. But where everything differs, this whole story, everything that we've gone through, is those last two, four and five. And what blooding and what Judenjag has done to these troops is hard. Obviously, it's it, it's shown them to be murderous and killing. And war crimes and and war against humanity we, we we can say all of that but what it's actually drilling down to is how deep do we have to go to find the criminality it's not just the officers in the ss yeah, exactly. and, and this, that, and the other. this is this is the ordinary soldier yeah we're in a we're, we're in a <laughs> we're in a very interesting place now no absolutely um yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost lost for words, but you've, you've got, this is our last slide. Um, so yeah, we're, you're, you're tying up some loose ends there and hunting and yeah, I'll hand back to you. Then I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Let me just take you back now to the whole story. So remember we started with Adolf Galland doing his thing. Well, as I said, we found Galland 
this pic this picture of him in the bottom left corner with with a set of antlers and he told the story that he was fighting on the eastern front and it's always been strange to me that having been made the inspector of fighters after molders um, had been killed on his way to Udet's funeral. It always seemed odd to me that Garland was totally reluctant to tell to, to mention the Eastern Front anywhere in his memoirs. It's almost like, you know, that never happened. I wasn't there, nothing to do with me. And we had this story in this article, that one little article there, where he's actually in an area, in a forest, literally round the corner where 10,000 Jews are being killed at that very time. And he's there hunting a stag. He not only hunts the stag, but he confronts three partisans, shoots one, and then comes back and tells the story to the, the hunting newspaper that he was on the, on the drive to Moscow and that he'd seen the people's paradise and the Bolsheviks are the worst people in the world. Now, there's every reason why he doesn't want that being mentioned in his memoirs. But the crazy thing about this dude is he then goes into the Horrido book in the 60s, 67, 68, Tolliver and Constable, and describes the whole Hubertus thing. Hubertus is the patron saint of hunting. And they talk about the Horrido as the thing, you know, you've shot somebody down, we all have a look. Well, it's the same word they use in hunting. So I've tied him up there with two hunting stories. And then just as that NCO is leading those boys out of that forest, Galland issues this document. And you look to 23rd of June, 1944, he's releasing a, a, a hunter's cheese fever, which is you know, the fighter pilot booklet. And one of the main pictures is if you shoot down that flying fortress, that Jewish man is going to lose all that money. Mm. That, that, that's Garland. Garland has done that. He's issued that. Yeah. So... And, and people, what I respect about among the many things I respect about it is you're allowing people to fill in the dots themselves on this. You're, you're not you're, you're, those who have read anything or about about Galland and they're, they're you've laid it out and they're filling in the dots themselves. They know exactly what you're saying without you actually having to say it. And I think we all can we can all understand where the thrust of this and 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 the fact you're doing it in a very subtle but yet in kind of engaging way is to your credit it is it is awesome stuff that's the end of my slide set so if you want to it, it, i mean i don't know we've got time for questions or we can do a little bit yeah i mean i, I just i i want to just carry on my gushing slightly and say what a privilege it is to listen to someone who is actually doing something brand new with history because as much as i like talking about who fucked up at operation market garden and the same old chestnuts and it's so important and and those shows are good and and you know the amount of new books that come out every year on the dam busters raid and the so and so and that yeah you know, it, it is absolute privilege to be talking to someone who's started something absolutely from fresh and not just on a cursory view over a few weeks, but spent 15 years of their life investigating this to a level of detail that is just outstanding and 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 take that praise because people who are watching this are realize that we are we're kind of in the in the room of greatness here you know and richard holmes will be very proud i think of of having mentored you a bit in this because what you've brought to the table here is just outstanding and it's it's in it's new history and it's i hate the word revisionist because revisionist has a negative connotation all history all all written history all YouTube history should have something new to say. Otherwise, what's the bloody point? So I don't like the word revisionist, but your book is 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 interesting in the sense it's going into something different. And and what's you know a simple question? What what's who do you want? It's not actually. It sounds like a simple question. Probably not a simple question. Who do you want to read your book, and what do you want them to take away from it? Um, I think scholars in general. And I think students of the subject, I think what would interest me most, to be 
brutally honest, is to see young people. And, you know, we had this discussion earlier today, didn't we, that the um, Machete, uh, our friend Dustin, is contemplating buying a book for a young lady who's 13 and she's studying subjects similar to this, and, and, and we'll sort that out later. But I think it would be good if young people could see this kind of story and not pick up too quickly on what I would call the the myths and fantasies of this whole genre of military history, which is, you know, we've 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 got to the stage where we've heard about Galland and Steinhoff and Rahl and all of these people for so long, but we've never really asked the question: What was the Luftwaffe supposed to be doing? Hmm. Yeah, and was it really built to be? this thing at the Blitzkrieg, or was it supposed to be a colonial force that was going to sit behind Germany's borders and every time an enemy came along, it was going to fly over the top of the forest, destroy the enemy, and then go back to the pit. So, you know, that that's, um, um, you know, following on from your very kind words, that, that would be where I would like to see people reading the book. And several colleagues have said the students will love this because it it's got all these maps and they can manipulate them. And, you know, the many of the students these days have iPads and tablets and what have you, so they can, you know, big up the pictures and what have you. That's all good. I'm, I'm all in favour of that. But also at the same time, <laughs> as I said earlier, I don't want people to lose the skills of reading maps. Because if you lose the skills of reading maps, you won't be able to do the GIS work properly. You know, you know yeah, no, it's 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 about bringing all the skills together. And I think it also sends out a very simple message. There is still new stuff to investigate with World War II. And, you you know, although we are rehashing and reanalyzing the same events, there is new stuff to be said. There are new, new areas to investigate. And you can do something new. And I would like to think this 13-year-old girl, and the story, folks, is Jenny Grant, who was on the Polish uh, show a couple of days ago it's, it's someone she's sort of mentoring a, a girl who was you know indian background english girl who has picked up a book on world war ii and spitfires and how because there's been lots of discussions about inclusivity and 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 changing the world war ii history world and it was just a little twitter conversation that went on today and i, I it, it's impressive to me that they're gonna there are gonna be people out there who are going to read books by yourself and maybe you see some of the stuff I do on YouTube and be inspired to say, not only can I do I want to get into World War II history, but I want to say something new about World War II history and not just regurgitate and reanalyze something that's been done before. Although that that is important as well. Looking at the historiography of where we are is important, but there is new stuff to be said. And I think, you know, I can only endorse what I say. It's, it's, I, I wish I'd read all the book, but I will get back to it. Nick Budd is watching it. He got his copy today. He's starting it tomorrow. Mary and I know he's got a copy of it. So, you know, it's important stuff and, and you, you, very well written and you explain it. And I just hope you have incredible success with it because you absolutely deserve it. Well, it's very kind of you. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a great sense of relief, I have to say. <laughs> and, I was, and I'm not going to say to you, what's the next thing, uh, Philip? Because I know that at the end of 15 years' work, you probably want a bit of a break for a while and just, I don't know, write a comic or something and do something a little bit less uh, less involving. But, you know, it is, it, it, it's your magnum opus. It's, 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 um, it, it's going to be an important work. I think people will be looking back in 20, 30, 40 years' time uh, as some of Richard Holmes' books are, and there's lots of disposable World War II history that we, I put by it, put it on the shelf, and frankly, I won't go back to it again. It just sits there in that, in that work, that shelf there. But what you're doing, I think, is going to be is going to be influential in years to come, and and you're set you're setting a precedent of of how to do history. I think, and okay. very proud to know you. Very kind. Um, I mean, if you really wanted to know what the big project is after this, is this whole story all over again in the First World War. Okay. Okay, so going back a bit further. No, I mean, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's you're, you're welcome on this show anytime, and, and people have been thoroughly impressed by your knowledge, and it's been good viewing numbers, and I think this will get talked about this show. And it, it, it went about sort of two-thirds of the way in, the comments stopped. And sometimes that just means people are just taking it all on board and just they're kind of processing it all and realizing where these 
these threads are going and where it's all going to lead to and the the the, the, rev, the revelation stuff about Adolf Gallen at the end there and everybody's coming away from this I guarantee you with a, a reappraisal of the Luftwaffe in their minds and, and that is that can only be a good thing um yeah I, I, can't, I, can't. I hope so I think I think it's good uh if if that's the case and and we're very lucky I mean I have to say People in Twitter have been very good and very kind. I'm, I've not had, you know, all of those fights and what have you. It's always seemed to be positive and co positive feedback. And there was when we did the previous program, there was huge positive positive feedback from people within Twitter. Um, I think it's it's very simple because you, people can tell what you're saying isn't just some flippant comment based on you know a hunch. It's all based on serious study of documentation and archives over many years so they know they know well enough not to bother to kind of challenge you on it because clearly what you're saying is 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 primary sources secondary sources investigation behind it so there's no point saying well you're wrong about the Luftwaffe because I think they're great no one's going to try and use that kind of argument against you because it would just be pointless because you, you have a you have all this body of work behind you to back up what you say and you and you're doing it in a very careful and considered and 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 respectful way and that's it I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna stop, I'm gonna bring this to the end of me because i'm gonna sound like some you know you know those interview what was it on was this multicolored swap shop when they'd let some of the pop stars be interviewed by 12 year old kids i'm kind of in that that area now where i i'm a 12 year old girl who's just met george michael and andrew ridgely and i don't quite know what to say now it's 1981 <laughs> and i'm 12 and i i just but, think you're I'm great blushing. I, look blush blush blushing no I, i'm gonna have to stop now because i'm just gushing but just yeah say one thing just to save all our blushes a lot of it is down to richard holmes he instilled this discipline into me yeah so you know big thank yeah, you and, and you are also you know credit to you you're big up big on on promoting an inclusive history world you know so many of the people you cite as influential are female historians and that's refreshing and and you don't you, you know you're looking at psychology as well you're looking at other wars all to influence the, the, the primary study of this war you're working on right now and that's to your credit so well i'm going to remind people what we got coming up and i'll come back and say goodbye in a minute so folks um uh i think i'm gonna uh, the show we were going to do about royal navy judition i think i have to postpone that again katie's just too busy i probably will do something with on this day in canadian military history tomorrow night probably same time we'll do a quick half an hour an hour kind of ask us anything about the canadian army or the canadian military in world war ii i'll do something with brad tomorrow so and it's also to bring some traffic to Brad's incredible uh, YouTube channel on this day in Canadian military history. So watch that space. I'll probably get that up for on YouTube, but that will be probably tomorrow night. Then Friday, of course, Dilip Sarkar is coming back to finish off Arnhem Week with his look at some of the fallen of the Battle of Arnhem. Some incredible moving stories of some British soldiers, German and Dutch civilians who fell in the Battle of Arnhem. And then next week, it's um, Eastern Front Week, which will be pretty heavy, but pretty cool. Some amazing guests coming up. So there we are. Um, like as usual, Check out what we're doing on Twitter. Check out Dr. Philip Blood on Twitter. If you haven't got the book, just go and get it. And we have got this competition running. As you know, folks, I have four signed copies of Birds of Prey that Philip has sent to me. And there's a tweet, Twitter competition running. All you have to do to win a chance of winning is retweet or tweet about Philip's book and World War II TV. And your name goes on the list. And at the end of Friday, I will take the people on the list and randomly, but it'll be mag, will randomly throw out the numbers. And those four lucky winners will receive a signed copy of the book. So uh, perhaps before you wait until you see if you won the competition until Friday and then buy the book. So just maybe just hold off of pressing the button to buy it now. But then when you, if you haven't won the competition, you can buy it Saturday morning. That's that, that'd be my advice to you. So there we are. So right now it just remains me to say, thank you very much, Dr. Philip blood for joining us. And I, and I'm not only thanking you for doing the show, but thank you for just being an engaging fellow human being and, and a mate I haven't actually met yet, but there will be a beer some point. We Either will I will come it. to Germany or you will come to France or we'll meet on neutral territory in London or something, but we will, we will actually physically meet one day. So yeah, thank you very much. Your presentation is awesome. I just hope we, we, you know, you, you're, you're, you get the success you deserve from this book because it is absolutely outstanding. Delighted. Thank you very much. And it's been okay. very kind. Well, 
There we are. So this is Paul Woodard from World War Two TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow with Brad for a Canadian Ask Us Anything show. So thank you very much for watching and I hope there'll be lots of positive comments in the feedback about this show within minutes of me closing it down. So have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for watching.